Um, yeah, thank you for BrizTech for having us, um, and well done to making it to the end of the day. We're not too long from the after party. Um, so today we're going to give a kind of introduction to quantum computing. I know a few people have heard about this, this area. Um, you might leave this room with more questions than answers, but hopefully we're going to also give you tools to then go and learn yourself and maybe start playing with some of the tools that people have developed. So that's the idea. So um, I'm here today with my colleague Alex, uh, and uh, we're going to uh, talk about yeah, this whole area. So uh, we're from a group at the University of Bristol. Uh, we kind of all lump into this group called the Quantum Engineering Technology Labs. Um, it's a group of probably now up to over 100 people uh, based at Bristol University. This is me and Alex, by the way. Um, and we kind of span uh, research in all different kinds of quantum technologies. That includes quantum computing, but also includes things like quantum sensors and quantum communication systems. Um, and we're also in here today uh, with QTech, which is our quantum engine, uh, an entrepreneurship center, which Andy here runs. If you're interested in that, then come speak to us. Um, yeah, and we do lots of research and lots of cool stuff. So if you're interested in this stuff, certainly come and engage with us, because we're always looking for, for things to play with and do research on. Um, so what am I talking about today, or what are we talking about today? I'm going to give first an introduction into the landscape of where quantum computing is at at the moment, both in terms of industry and in research institutions. Um, I'm then going to try and give you a 10-minute introduction into quantum computing and the difference between quantum and classical computing, so conventional computing. Um, I'm then going to talk about some physics, because I'm a physicist, so I want to teach you some cool quantum physics at the same time, uh, and then give you a brief introduction into some hardware implementations that people have been working on uh, recently. Uh, Alex is then going to take over, um, and Alex is much more focused towards the algorithm side and the application side. So she's going to talk about a particular algorithm called the search algorithm, uh, some applications, and then also show you some simulation uh, of, we're going to do a live demo, which is going to work. Um, so we'll see. Right, so Bat Kid obviously is the place to start for quantum computing. Um, so what does Bat Kid have to do with quantum computers? Uh, nothing is the answer. So this, if, for those who don't know, uh, this was in San Francisco and uh, this poor kid was suffering from cancer and one of his wishes was to be Batman for a day. Um, so actually what I'm going to talk about is Batman. So this is a guy called Eric Johnson, uh, Johnston, sorry, EJ, who uh, is a, or was a classical programmer. So he came to uh, our research group around two and a half years ago and said, hey, I'm a classical programmer. I do machine level code. I'm interested in quantum computing. Can I come and you know, uh, find out a bit more about it? He spent uh, two years doing a postdoc with us, so actually uh, kind of helping us program hardware, but also learning about quantum computing. And EJ now works in a quantum computing startup in Silicon Valley. So my point with this slide is to say that if, you're, if what I tell you today sounds really interesting and you'd like to get involved, it's, it's possible to make the leap to go from being a classical programmer and actually start uh, contributing to the, the whole quantum computing scheme. Um, so yeah, come and join us is my point. Um, so this is the landscape at the moment in research. So this is just a summary of the, um, or it, it, it's a bit old, so it's a few years old now, um, but it's a summary of the amount of money investment that uh, individual countries have put into researching in quantum tech in general. Um, Surprisingly, <laughs> the UK is actually was doing, is doing pretty well. Um, we've, uh, we're the first country to have a, a kind of na nationwide quantum technology program. Um, so we started very well. And that recently has been mentioned in the, um, in the budget. So we've, it, we've now got refunded. So there's lots of money. And the UK is very interest, interested in, in funding this kind of technology. Um, big players are also, unsurprisingly, in the United States and China as well. So these are kind of the hubs of. Uh, and the EU actually had a 1 billion, pa 1 billion euro investment recently in quantum tech. So there's lots of money there. Um, from the industrial side, um, this is actually an old slide now. So this would be enormous if I was going to show you all the companies that are invested and working in quantum computing now. Um, it varies in size and scale of companies. So you have the, you know, the big players. Google actually just bought an entire research group of that was doing quantum computing research, and they said, OK, you can come work for us. Um, but we also have things, we, we have small scale uh, startups. So, one qubit were initially small scale. They're a software company working on mapping problems to quantum computers. Um, but we also have some very large scale. So, Rigetti was a 50 million pound plus startup, and they're now of order 100 people um, working towards this whole uh, 
initiative. So there's a whole range of things. And this, yeah, goes from software to hardware to kind of peripheral technology. And then also there's some new strategies and there's uh, uh, consulting and stuff like this. So it's an active, active field. Um, right, okay, so what's the difference between a quantum and a classical computer? So what's a classical computer is the first question you ask. So you have, you need bits and you need gates. That's what you need for a classical computer. So your bit is your zero and your one. And normally physically what that is, is that's current or voltage in a wire. So if you have current, it's a one. If you don't, it's a zero. And you need some operation that you can perform on your bits. So this is a NAND gate. Uh, which hopefully some of you are familiar with. And actually, you can prove that if you have access to this gate, then you can do any logical operation you want. So it's a, we call this a complete gate set. Um, so this allows you, all you need is this and this, and you've got a classical computer which you can program. Quantum computing is quite similar, but we just put quantum in front of the names of things. So you have a quantum bit, a qubit, and uh, these things, so anything with this kind of, these are called kets. Uh, that just symbolizes that it's a quantum thing. There's a more mathematical description of what that thing is, but for now it's just a quantum thing. And this qubit also can be written as a zero and one, but there's some other exotic states that it can be in, which we'll call superposition states. I'll go into exactly what that means in a second. But you get more degrees of freedom, let's say, for now. But there's also just quantum gates as well. So we, two examples here, I've got a, one called a Hadamard gate and we'll call a phase gate, and I'll show you how you can implement these physically. Um, and there's a whole gate set you can define for quantum computers, which if you allow yourself access to those gates, then you can do all of quantum computing. And you can show that uh, this gate set is actually allows you to do more things than this one. That's, that's basically the principle. Um, in terms of actually, I think, uh, this, the most similar thing you can imagine to a quantum computer for now is, is a GPU. So it's a very specialized piece of hardware that can do some tasks very, very well. But likely, the first implementation you'll see of a quantum computer won't be just a quantum computer that you do everything on. It will be a very specialized piece of kit that you'll fire off the problems that it's good for uh, to it. And then you'll do classical computation on a classical computer, because those are very also very good pieces of hardware. So that's how you should imagine a quantum computer for now. Um, Right, OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit of physics, uh, and I'm going to show you how you can implement these uh, qubits and these gates. So uh, in Bristol, we're famous for using photonics, so photons. So I'm going to talk about photons. So this is called dual rail encoding. So I have a photon, and I have two paths this photon can be in. And I'm going to say, hey, if it's in the top path, it's a 0. I'm going to call that a logical 0. And if it's in the bottom path, it's going to be a logical 1. So that's my, my qubit. Um, and I'm going to see uh, what happens when I put this thing on a 50-50 beam slitter. So this is a half-silvered mirror, which is used a lot in optics. If you shine a laser on a beam slitter, half the light goes straight through and half of it reflects off. So half of the light here goes straight through and half of it reflects off here. You can then ask the question, well, what happens at the output? So if I want to fire in lots of photons individually, one at a time, how many will I get up here? Or what's the probability that I measure a photon here? And what's the probability I measure a photon in the one state? And unsurprisingly, it's 50-50. So if this thing is perfectly balanced, then half the time this photon comes in and reflects off and goes up the top, and half the time it goes straight through. This seems fine. This is OK. We're happy with this. I can build a slightly more complicated thing. This is called a Max Ender interferometer. And it just involves doing a beam splitter and then applying another beam splitter. And then you can ask the same question. You can say, hey, what, what's the probability that I get a photon out in a 0 or 1 at the output here? Fine question. So what can happen? Well, first the photon could come in. It could bounce off the first mirror. It could bounce off the second mirror. And then you get it in the top. It could go straight through. So it could just go straight through this, these two beam splitters and come out the top again. So those are your two possibilities of getting a 0 or a 1. I can't remember which way around I had them now. Uh, and then there's two ways of it coming out of the bottom rail. So there's it can bounce and then go through, or go through and then bounce. And these seem fine. These all make sense. So you should expect at the output, again, you get 50-50. You've got two chances here and two chances here. So you get 50-50 chance of each. Uh, that's not what happens. You get this. So the photon always comes out the top, which should seem striking. Uh, and this should seem weird. And you're not really sure what's going on. Uh, I'm going to try and explain why this happens now. This might go horribly wrong, but uh, please come speak to me afterwards if it doesn't make sense. So 
what does this beam splitter actually do? So when this beam splitter hits this first thing, everything in your mind says, right, okay, it must either again go through the top rail or it goes through the bottom rail. But if we use quantum mechanics, that's not what happens. We have to describe it as being in a superposition of both the top and the bottom at the same time. So, wow, okay, I should make that careful. The maths, at least, describes it as um, something that goes up. Of course, that doesn't make any sense to have a photon that's split and gone into two rails at the same time. So if you measure it, like we have done, then you only measure it in the top or the bottom. That makes sense. But the maths underlying quantum mechanics says that there's a possibility of it being, you know, there's, there's some amplitude, much like a wave, of it being in one of these two paths. Once you apply this second beam splitter to it, what happens is that you get amplitudes, the possibilities of all these things happening at the same time, but the possibility of this thing happening actually is equal and opposite to the possibility of this thing happening. So you actually get cancellation of probabilities. So these two, have, these two possible events that could happen actually have equal and opposite amplitude. This is much like waves. So this is, this is the whole particle wave paradox where uh, this thing that's solid and like a particle is now acting like a wave where the peak of the wave, this, is meeting with the trough of a wave, which is this, and they're actually canceling out. So this is, but the, 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 the weird thing is, is that the photon's doing it to itself. Which seems odd. So this all seems weird, right? And this is, this is a superposition principle. This is one of the fundamental things of quantum mechanics. Um, and you can imagine that this is just an extra degree of freedom. Allowing yourself to have this quantum interference um, is an extra knob that you can kind of play with and manipulate. Um, there's another way uh, we can kind of play with these kind of outputs and mess with this quantum interference, and that's by using something called a phase gate. So if I put something here, and physically what that is is just slightly delaying, uh, it's kind of, it adds a delay into this arm. And actually by setting this to a certain value, so if I set it to zero, it does nothing, so we get the same output, this photon always ends up here. But if I set it to pi by two, I can actually get it back, so there's 50-50 chance of each. And if I set it to pi, then the photon actually always ends up here. So it's just, this is actually a way of changing how these interfering possibilities are happening. So it's changing how this wave is moving through the interferometer. Um, and so I've just talked a load of physics. What does, what does that care? What does that matter? Uh, actually, these are gates. So this Hadamard gate I spoke about is this superposition generator. It's this beam splitter. So this Hadamard gate generates the superposition. Uh, that's, what, that's what this gate does. And this phase gate is another phase gate. Wow. I'm surprising this phase shifter, sorry, is a phase gate. So it's another operation. It's one of the gates you need to do quantum computation. So these two physical things are actually the start of your quantum computer. It's kind of initializing two gates that you need to perform in your gate set. Um, so how do you actually build a computer using these kind of rudimentary interferometers? You build something like this. This is called a quantum walk, as you put the photon in and you watch and see how it walks through this interferometer. Um, and you can imagine this does kind of weird stuff. So if we now question at the output here, um, where is this photon going to end up? You count the probability, where, where, which output is it going to come in? Classically, if, so if you turn the quantum interference off and just say, right, these are just beam slippers as we think they should act, you get something like this. You get a Gaussian distribution that, where most of them end up here because there's lots of possible ways you can actually end up in this path. But if you want to end up here, you have to go down here, down here, down here, right? So you get less out of this point. If you allow yourself quantum interference and you turn this thing on, then actually the distribution end, you end up with gets like this. This is a quantum walk, they call this. Um, and so actually you end up with most photons up here. And that's because all of the stuff here ends up cancelling out and interfering. So you end up with high probabilities of getting these two photons out here. By changing these phase shifters, you can change these distributions. Um, and the kind of way I guess you can slightly think about this, this is very hand wavy, is that this quantum interference allows you to generate much, a much more uh, wide vary of distributions, to kind of allowed access to much different distributions. And I can match my, you can imagine this now as being an input where I have a zero and a one, and this is now a binary output. So I've got, you know, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, and so on. So this is now mapping an input to an output, and that starts to build up our quantum computer. So that's quite hand woven, but hopefully it's enough to get you interested. Uh, so how do we build these things? So what do these things look at in the real world? So uh, this is an optics lab, a conventional optics lab. These things were built. So a beam slitter is normally something you hold. It's quite macroscopic. 
You normally direct it around the table using mirrors and using these uh, things here are the phase shifters. Uh, and it's kind of on meter scale boards. Uh, this is Felipe from Bl Bristol. This is actually a lab in Bristol. Um, and this thing can be quite cumbersome. Quantum computing is probably going to require many, many, many beam splitters, millions of beam splitters and phase shifters. So maybe doing this on a huge scale is not so smart. Bristol says, OK, we don't want to do this. We need lots of components. So what we're going to do is we're going to do silicon photonics or integrated quantum photonics. So this is a silicon chip. This now takes these bulk experiments and implements all the operations you could do in bulk, but does it in a silicon device, which is made in the same foundries that your, you know, any silicon electronics device is made in. So this thing is highly scalable because it's very small. It's also highly repeatable because it's based in silicon photonics, and silicon is a great material that we know how to work with and produce many devices. Um, so this is really where Bristol, this is, Bristol actually leads this whole research field. We're world leading in this field. So this is where Bristol is placing its bets on how to build a quantum computer. Um, and yeah, you go from a few meters to a few millimeters, micrometers. How are other people doing it? So this is other implementations. Uh, possible ways is implementing new qubit using superconducting rings or superconducting wires. Um, so these things need to be at very cold temperatures, around one Kelvin. Um, you can also trap charged particles, so trap ions in an electric field and fire lasers at them, and that changes the quantum state that they are in. And there are also other solid state spin systems, so you can dope materials with other materials, and that creates some spin uh, system using electrons, and that's also a promising technique. Where are we at now? Uh, we have, so this is the world record now for qubits at the moment, 120 from Rugetti, this, this startup. Uh, and you'll see that most of them are actually superconducting. So superconducting is leading the way at the moment for qubit numbers. Um, the point I'd like to make, so um, as Alex will go through, you don't need many qubits, probably, logical qubits, to make something that would actually do a computation that would be hard. But the problem is at the moment that these qubits are noisy. Um, so normally what you have to do is take lots of these physical qubits and you can encode a nice qubit in many physical ones. Um, so this number, although it looks, you know, it's small, um, but we're kind of getting there, I guess, and, uh, but they are noisy. So if we can reduce the noise, then this number kind of becomes more prominent. It's kind of more, a more powerful qubit system. Uh, there's lots of examples here of um, places you can look up this stuff. Cool. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Alex, who's going to talk about some algorithms. First, I'm going to get blinded by a light. Um, thank you, Ewan. So, yeah, I'm Alex. I was originally a computer scientist at Bristol. And nowadays, I'm a theoretical physicist. I like to describe my job as I sit around all day and ask the question, what cool stuff could you do with a quantum computer? And one cool thing I want to talk about today is quantum set. Searching. So what do I mean when I talk about searching? Well, you've got a problem such as, I don't know, where did I put my Bristex slides? And there's a large number of possible solutions to this problem. And so you're trying to find the correct solution, which in this case happens to be my OneDrive folder. So how long would it take you to solve this problem then? Well, if we were to just try every single folder in turn, you'd expect it to take roughly half the, no half the size number of possible answers to that question. So you might get lucky and find it the first time. You might get unlucky, and it's the very last one you check. But on average, you would roughly need to check half of them. And there could be techniques you use to solve the problem faster, but generally that would require more knowledge about the problem. It would require me to, for example, remember that maybe I didn't stick it in, say, one of my Git, say, my Dropbox folder, for example. So can, under this model where we've got very little knowledge about what our problem is, is can quantum computers do anything to offer us a benefit? And the answer is yes. And and to go through how that's the case. But first, a little bit of motivation for why I chose this problem in particular. There's a lot of good quantum, quantum computing algorithms out there. 
So the first one is there's a common misconception with quantum computing, which I want to kind of use this as a mo example, use this to resolve. The second is that a lot of quantum algorithms can seem quite in counterintuitive and very complicated, particularly when you start looking at how can I write this down in a programming language. Whereas this one is actually relatively simple, and I will be giving a explicit demonstration where you can see the code I use for it. The third is that, as I will go through, we can still get some fairly decent speed speed ups with this approach. And finally, searching is a very broad question. Question: I haven't really stated anything about what what I'm exactly I'm searching for. So there's a lot of good applications out there, and I'll be going through a couple that people have researched in the past couple of in the past few years. So let's start off with this first point. What is the misconception I'm talking about? So here's something that a quantum computer cannot do. So you take your quantum computer and you initialize it. So you've got a whole bunch of qubits all initialized into the zero state. You then apply the Hadamard gates that eight that you and talked about to each qubit, and that would produce some kind of superposition of every single possible answer to your problem. And then you just run some checking operation on them, some circuit to check each superposition, and that will just spit out the correct answer. Unfortunately, quantum computers can't exactly work like that. And it's because of it's because one of the rules of superposition is that you need to keep, keep information about your state. So all we'll get is just a superposition of every possible answer and whether or not it was right or wrong. So when we have a look at our result, all we'll get is one random possible solution and whether or not that solution was right or wrong. So we won't actually get any benefit over just checking each solution individually. <coughs> and this is something that a lot of people end up misinterpreting about quantum mechanics, enough that noted qu computer scientist and quantum computing theorist Scott Aronson has at the top of his blog, if you take just one piece of information from this blog, quantum computers would not solve hard search problems instantaneously by simply trying all the possible solutions at once. So, what can quantum computers do instead? Well, this is kind of a nice starting point for it, but quantum computers can do more than just putting things into a superposition. There's this phase operation that you and also talked about. So let's, let's kind of use it. So this was a technique developed by Love Grover back in 1997. So, and it starts this similarly to what I was mentioning before. So you start with your quantum computer initialized and then you apply your Hadamards and you generate a superposition of every single possible answer. <coughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a check circuit to check these answers, and I'm going to apply the phase gate to the correct ones. So all of the others stay the same, and the correct answers, I'll just add a minus sign to them. And so that will produce then some superposition where some of your answers are the way that they were before, and some will have this negative phase attached to them. So, and then we'll run the, another bunch of Hadamards on them. <coughs> now, if we didn't have this check and flip operation, then all we'd have is a bunch of Hadamards and a bunch of Hadamards. So, like the Mark Zender interferometer example that Ewan gave earlier, this would just give back your original zero state. But now we've got these different phases acting within the computer, it's going to produce something different, something that's not quite the zero state. And so there's some there's different interference happening within our system now. And what we're going to do for that is we're going to then say that, OK, we'll only flip the zero state now. So we're, only get, we're going to apply another phase gate, but only to uh, zip bit 
qubits in the zero state. And we'll then feed that back into where we started. And we repeat this a bunch of times. And eventually, at some point, we're going to stop repeating this and spit out our answer to this pro problem. So I'm now going to show what this looks like in actual code. So hopefully this works. So this is QC Engine. It's a piece of software uh, developed by Eric Johnston, the, Matt, the re software engineer that Ewan mentioned earlier in this talk. And he was one interested in developing a JavaScript-based simulator for quantum computing. So you can just go to this website and run this simulator directly in your browser. And this is what the code looks like. So I've initialized it to four qubits. And we've got that our main function is going to start off by initializing our qubits into the zero state. We're then going to run our Hadamards on it. And then we're going to apply this Oracle flip, which is going to flip on which is going to set the phase on the correct answer, which in our case is going to be 12. Well, and then we've got this other function, Grover iteration, which is going to <coughs> basically do the um, apply the phase to the zero state. And we're going to run that twice and spit out our answer. So, I run it. This is what the circuit looks like. So this is our qubits being initialized. This is uh, us creating the, or the uniform superposition. And then we've got applying our oracle, applying the um, phase to the zero state. And we're repeating that twice. So if I go back to here, and we can look at what our state looks like. So this is, these are the different states of our four qubits. So there's 16 of them in total, ranging from 0 to 15. And so right at the start, we've just generated a uniform superposition. So these filled in circles represent the probability of measuring that result. So Currently, all the circles are equal size, and therefore, we've got a uniform superposition. When we apply our oracle, again, we've got a uniform superposition. All of our circles are equal sized. But now this line on the 12 state has flipped down. And so that's an indication that we've applied our phase operation to this state now. And so then, when we're going to apply a similar operation for when we're in the zero state. And then when we get back to where we were before, we suddenly find the probability of measuring 12 has increased drastically compared to, and the probability of measuring every other state has decreased. And then when we run our Oracle again, we've got the same state as before, but again, just flip the phase. And then when we run our final iteration, we find that we've got almost perfect chances of measuring the correct answer. So in just two, essentially two queries to our oracle, we have managed to find the correct answer to the problem, whereas if we were to simply guess randomly at the 16 possible answers, you would expect us to, on average, need eight queries to theories. So how well can we expect to do on average then? And in if we were to do generalize this from just 16 possible answers to many possible answers, how well could we expect to do? So Love Grover showed that 
you can find the solution with, if you've got n possible answers, you can find the solution with high probability after square root n queries, theories. So that can be quite a significant speed up. And so this was explored in some very recent work by people at the University of Bristol, where they showed, they looked at applying Grover search to um, sat, is, sat solver thing. So you've got a Boolean formula, and you're trying to find possible solutions to it. And so this table here represent, shows different, uh, different architectures that they believe might be feasible in the near, for a quantum computer in the near future. And th this is the largest Boolean formula that such an architecture using in Grover search could solve in one day. And this number down here is how much faster it would be than the fastest SAT solvers we've got today trying to solve the equivalent, equivalent formula. And so this can be quite impressive. We've re for small numbers, we've already got what speed ups of 10 to the 3 or even 10 to the 5 if we're looking optimistically. But there's a huge caveat here, which is the need for fault tolerance, like Ewan was talking about earlier. So this is assuming our qubits are currently working ideally. If we don't assume that, if we need our qubit, if we need many physical qubits to actually build, to actually build these ideal qubits to run these algorithms, then this could be worse. And how much worse can it be? Well, they look, these were researchers looked into that as well. And what they found was the number of qubits required was, in the worst case, 10 to the 13, which is quite a daunting number the more you look at it. Um, so there are, some, there are some kind of silver linings to this. First of all, it's worth remembering that these, this was the, these were the largest speed ups that these researchers found when doing this work. So it might be that there are smaller Boolean formulas which the number of qubits required is more reasonable and we still might be able to get some speed up, just not as large as these numbers here. So there are still, so plus there's the obvious uh, task of we might be able to come up with better, pr better q quality qubits, and we might also be able to come up with better fault tolerant and proposals, and that in doing both of those, bring down these numbers to something that's hopefully more reasonable. So I've mentioned that this work was looking at satisfiability Boolean formulas. Are there any, what other problems can we apply this to? Well, there's been a couple. So I mentioned satisfiability. The researchers who worked on that paper also looked at graph coloring. So you've got a map, and you're trying to color every region on that map such that no two adjacent regions share the same color. A uh, project I was involved a project I was involved in a couple of years back looked at applying this to applying a similar technique to the traveling salesman problem. So again, you've got a map with a bunch of cities on it, and you're trying to find the fastest way of visiting every city. There's also been a couple of applications within statistics, such as finding maximum or minimum values and estimating the means or medians of some variables. And finally, in cryptography, there's been some research in using this to find collisions in hash functions and seeing if we can do that faster than we can with classical computers. So, what's that? so that's a bunch of the cool things you can do with this search searching technique. Um, there's also other out, but there's other cool things you can do with a quantum computer as well. So, other applications people have come up with include the famous one is factoring. So the fundamental back security backbone of RSA has been proven to be solvable efficiently on a quantum computer. Uh, and this is not just true for back 
for factoring, but has also been explored for other um, cryptography schemes. So the other examples include discrete logarithms have fit in so found to solve efficiently, and a couple of elliptic curve schemes as well. There's also been a lot of interest recently in simulations, so trying to simulate physical or chemical systems. And this is one that's been of particular interest in the physics community as being considered kind of the main candidate for where quantum computers could offer us a benefit in the near fu future. And finally, one that has come up in recent years has been machine learning. So there's been a lot of interest around, so a lot of machine learning techniques focus around the problem of inverting a matrix. And a couple of years ago, that, uh, some researchers at MIT found that that could be implemented a fit efficiently on a quantum computer subject to a couple of caveats. So that's a bunch of the cool things you can do with a quantum computer, but when can you expect to get involved and how can you get involved? Well, first of all, you can learn a bit more from a project that you and I worked on a couple of years back where we were teaching quantum computing to six, this was for 16 to 17 year olds, but we've get have used these worksheets in a number of other places as well. So you can go here, and this gives you um, a number of worksheets, all based around Eric Johnston's engine quantum simulator that we were showing off earlier. And the, these go through things like the principles of quantum computing, Grover's algorithm, which I showed earlier, and also some other things as well as how to implement and them on an and run them on an actual quantum computer. And finally, if you want to actually go and play with one of these devices in the real world, you also have the opportunity to do that. So these are a bunch of programming languages which you can use to write quantum computing code yourself. So QC Engine is what we showed off today. There's also Strawberry Fields, which is designed by a company called Xanadu in Toronto. Microsoft have released their East, an entire quantum software development kit, which you can download and run on your computer. And they've got simulators based, uh, based on Microsoft Azure. There's also been QIS Kit and the IBM Quantum Experience, which allows you to write quantum code and actually run it on one of IBM's quantum computers in New York and get answers back to you in real time. And similarly, there is Forrest, which is by this 50 million pound startup for Getty that you and Matt mentioned earlier, and also offer you the chance to run on what they call their quantum processing units, or QPUs. So that's all we've got for us. You can find us, but the two of us, by email or Twitter if you have anything that you can't on, on, that we can't answer in the question session. But other than that, we're happy to take questions. So I'm just looking at the thing that I've just drawn down about how the Grover search stuff works. Yeah, yeah. You talk about only flipping the zero state stuff. What, yes. Like, how, how, how do you know that that's going to give you good answers? Or is so, that far too much for a talk like this? So the idea is that you can, essentially, you're trying to find, so you can think of quantum computing as being rotation and so on. If we go back to view and slides many slides ago. Where is it? <laughs> I'm looking for the qubit, yeah. 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 So 
you can represent qubits as points on this sphere. And what you you can is so quantum operations such as the phase gate are just rotations around that sphere. And so what you're essentially doing is you you can think of it as the check that you're in doing the correct answer the check for the correct answer is doing one rotation, and then the check that, that you're in the original state is doing another rotation. And those two rotations seem to counteract each other until eventually you get closer and closer to the correct answer state. It's I'm going to say okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most intuitive answer we can give. If, unfortunately. I didn't expect it to be a short answer, so <laughs> thanks. Um, I was just curious about the um, the integrated circuit that you had with the the yep. optics and trying to understand a little bit more about actually how that works and sort of you know, just looking at it, is that basically a bunch of light guides in silicon and yeah. implementing mirrors and phase shifts yeah. in the way you had it? Yeah. And so, assuming that then, um, how how dense is the, I mean, how many gates have you actually got on that? And what do you see the sort of future for, obviously, g you know, being able to shrink all that down and scale the number of gates on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, we use waveguides, they're called, which is just basically the same as wires, but for light. They just guide the light around the chip. Um, the two implementations, so if you want to apply a beam slitter and a phase shifter, which is generally two major operations you want to do, in an integrated chip, you take two waveguides where your photon is in one and one is empty, and you just bring them slightly close together, and actually there's some leakage of light from one to the other. And if you do it over the right length, you end up with 50% in one, 50% in the other, and that's how you do your beam slitter. At the moment, phase shifters are applied using heaters, so uh, this silver stuff here is actually electronic. So these are wires that go on the surface, and then they go down into the waveguide layer. And there's a strip of metal that uh, has a resistance, and you apply a voltage to those, and they heat up locally the area, and that's a phase shift. So that's how we do it. Those beam slitters and phase shifters are of order 100 microns or less. So they're actually around 50 microns. So they're less than a human hair, all these things. Um, the most complicated circuit we've made in Bristol, which is actually the m most complex quantum optics experiment that has been made so far, is of order 200 of those components all working at the same time. Um, so that's the level we're at. At the moment, uh, so these chips normally are around 12 centimeters in length uh, and six, uh, 12 mi uh, millimeters in length, sorry, and six millimeters uh, across. Uh, and we're now starting, so this chip, so how we work in Bristol is that we say we're going to do a chip run, and then everybody kind of bargains for a plot of land. And you get a plot of land to put your particular experiment on that you'd like to test. Uh, and so this chip actually has about 20 experiments, individual experiments for the whole group. Um, we're now reaching a point where chips have one experiment on. So we've now started to reach a point where we're kind of ordering chips that actually themselves have an entire experiment on and have hundreds of components. So we're, we're getting pretty complex. Um, we're lucky that the silicon, these are actually coming out of commercial fabs. So we send a GDS to a commercial fab. We use some in Europe, some in America and Singapore. And you wait six months, and then you just get a 30 or so chips back. So it's quite an efficient process. They're highly reliable. Um, and the exciting thing that we're looking for now is that so these processes are quite different from electronic fab. Uh, for the electronic circuits, but they're now starting to offer electronics with the transistors and things like that with the photonics as well. So there's real integration of these circuits in the same thing, which is really exciting. So it just seems that with that technique, and you know, we didn't say precisely how many qubits there were, but that slide showing 125 is like the best case just for blowing the amount of water that goes through. That's tr so uh, the, f the trouble with s photonics is making a single photon. It's an incredibly mm. challenging thing. And actually getting them, so one of the gates we didn't talk about was the entangling gate. Uh, so you can get this whole entanglement action at a distance. Um, that is also a very hard thing to do in photonics. Um, so it's likely that um, 
photonics will probably be, well, there are some people that will tell you photonics will do your quantum computing and we're, we're getting com complex. Uh, the most, I think at the moment, the photonics world record is in bulk and it's 12 qubits. Um, but, and that is predominantly because of the single photon generation. At the moment, single photon generation is probabilistic. So you kind of, you fire a bright pulse and you get some nonlinear mechanism in there which splits your pulse and generates, splits one high energy photon in your pulse into two low energy photons. If you detect one, then you know you've got another photon traveling through your chip. That's probabilistic. So when you start to uh, like rack these things up, you have to wait a very long time to get six clicks to go at the same time. So we've got some experiments that are five or six photon experiments. So five or six qubits, I guess. Um, and you'll wait for an hour and get one qubit ready to click. Um, the thing which is good is that having access to more modes. So I only gave you a zero and a one. So making more parts is easy, which is what you're saying. So you can make zero, so you can do Q tricks where you have zero, one, and a two. So you're no longer binary. Um, that's easy. It gives you some computational advantage, but it's not as, it kind of, it gets diminishing returns. So you can only push that so far, and then you actually start to want to want have more photons. So yeah, we're doing pretty well on the scalability, but um, there are some fundamental things, which if we solve, we do, we'll do accelerate very well. Um, so, if you made a push button single photon source, you would make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, this is a problem. So generally, uh, so one, so there are startups in photonics, and they're looking at this problem. The two leading examples are just to multiplex, so we can make lots of components. So we'll just make lots of, we'll make you know 50 sources, put them in a big switching network. And then when we push the button, we just wait. We find which one clicked at the time we want it. And then we'll just route that, and that will be our single photon. And you can just do that lots of times. And then you have reasonably push button sources. There are other systems like quantum dots. So you can get a, a kind of atomic spin. And actually, if you excite it in the right way at the right time, it will fire out a photon. So there are these kind of systems. But generally, it's a, actually a very, very hard problem. There are like hundreds of researchers trying to get this thing. So it's, it's hard for us. It's one of the limitations. But this is how we, we do. have time for one more question. OK, this might actually be a bit too big of a question to answer in this. But my understanding of um, quantum circuits is that you can't make them too deep at the moment because you end up suffering from decoherence. And that's why error correction is a bit of a problem. And it's a difficult thing. And it was sort of touched on. Are these sort of photonics, because I'm aware that it was something which has been more of a problem and definitely had more research in with the sort of superconducting microwave based ones. And annoyingly, you can't use the sort of the error correction things that were developed in classical computing because you can't copy information. Have I got that right? Yep. Yeah. So does this, this seems like it's more stable? Is, uh, is, do this, does this photonic system pose perhaps better, uh, um, allow better methods of error correction? Uh, so the errors are different. <laughs> the problem cool. is, so you'll get this dephasing thing, which happens when, yeah, so you'll get, you know, these superconducting circuits. If there's any heat, you'll start to get this qubit will wander. Uh, photons generally don't do much. Like if you, you know, if you take two lasers and put them like this, they'll just go straight through. And like generally getting photons to do anything to a material is quite hard. You have to pump it really hard. So they're generally pretty stable, but they also, uh, you lose them. So if you make a superconducting qubit, it's there and it's, you know, you don't lose it. You, I can put a photon into this thing, and it will go halfway along and scatter off a defect, and then you've just lost it. So um, fault tolerance for linear optics, which is what this thing is, is slightly different. Um, and uh, yeah, it's hard to say whether one is going to be more problematic than the other. But I think the reason why we're uh, kind of leaning to, so the reason we've gone for silicon, or why the research group has gone for silicon, is that we started with hopefully a technology that is scalable, so silicon fab is scalable, we know that, and we're trying to force qubits and a computational structure into a scalable technology. The question with superconducting and iron traps is they've gone with a very good qubit structure, and now they're trying to see if it's scalable. So there's arguments to say whether that that's even possible. I mean, these things are at millikelvin, which involve huge fridges and a huge amount of power, so it's maybe plausible that superconducting will start off first and then photonics will lead later or another implementation.